Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's nice to start with a big good morning. This is all about community this, uh, this weekend. Um, I'm Alan. I, I am the lead cartographer at Stamen. Um, and I'm also doing a PhD about OpenStreetMap at the University of British Columbia up in Vancouver. Um, yeah, was there some Vancouver in the room? Okay. Um, and so I have my, my notes on my laptop, but I'm using the, the, the presentation computer. So if I ever seem like I'm not moving my slides ahead, please let me know. So um, I'm, this presentation is, is something I'm working on as part of my dissertation research. Um, most of my research is looking at the past of OpenStreetMap, looking at um, the editing history of the planet file of our, of our data structures that we can study and see what happened over time. Um, and mostly I'm interested in what that tells us about community, about the people that make up OSM. What can we tell from that, that you know, footprint, that fingerprint of how we edit OSM, what that looks like in the database in terms of things that are edited, the types of things. Um, who are the editors? Are they the same people who create a feature, the same ones who are modifying it later? Or are the people who added all these roads at the beginning of OSM, do a lot of them move on and then new people come in later? So these are the questions that I'm, that I'm trying to study. Um, and before this presentation, I'm, I'm trying to jump off from that and look a little bit into the future of OSM. So like, what do these charts that we see all, uh, all the time of just the ever increasing node count in OSM, um, if we really look at the data, these, this raw um, statistical numbers, what does that tell us about not only the people behind this, these charts, but what's going on in the future, what might go on in the future? Um, and one of the reasons this is important is not only because we should be preparing our community, preparing the tools, preparing the structures for what that future might look like and what we want it to look like, but also what we imagine this future might be um, tells a lot about what types of editing activity, what types of data we value in OSM today. We all probably have different imaginations of what OSM should become. Um, and so part of what I'm gonna try to do is like think about what are some of those possible futures based on what we can see in the past of OSM. So yeah, let's look, it's actually we have some charts about people too, the number of active users. Um, you will probably remember sometime last year, OSM hit 2 million registered user accounts, which is amazing. Um, but once you dig behind numbers like that, you realize that, well, most of those 2 million, they registered for account, but they never actually edited the database. Um, and then the number of people who are actually editing on an ongoing basis, um, who have been active in each month, is much smaller. So these are numbers from, from the um, beginning of this year, so that it's a little bit higher. Um, in in the, uh, the Wikimedia key, keynote earlier, we heard that it's around 3,500 a month. And in fact, it's actually really great. I'm really excited to get to follow that keynote this morning, um, because in my research, I'm trying to make a lot of parallels with Wikipedia to see what we can learn from how the Wikipedia community evolved, um, also to use some, some, um, some concepts and theories from Wikipedia research and see if we can apply those to OSM. So here is the, the growth of, of Wikipedia articles. Um, I think these are, yeah, the English Wikipedia, so for all the English language articles. Um, and it's increasing, it's still going up, but if you look at the curve, the rate of increase is slowly um, decreasing. Um, the number of articles e added each year is less than the number that was added the year before. And here's also those numbers um, that Catherine was talking about this morning. Um, the number of, the pink line is the number of Wikimedians who make at least five edits per month. That number has been dropping since about 2007. Um, And uh, whether or not these metrics are really the best way to judge what's going on in the community is something we should also debate. As she talked about, these may not capture um, a really strong local community that where everyone is getting together every month and making one, um, adding one page. But these are still fairly good metrics to show that there is a decrease 
in the amount of activity. And the, those power users, the ones who make 25 um, edits a month or 100 edits a month, they're not dropping quite as fast. What's happening in Wikipedia um, is that a smaller number of people are doing more and more of the work. Um, it's like a lot of these long tail distributions that we see in internet communities. Like, there's a few people who are doing the bulk of all the editing, and that's true in OSM as well. The thing is, with Wikipedia, nobody quite knows why this is happening. Um, and for the last almost 10 years now, uh, the people who are also trying to facilitate Wikipedia's growth and who are studying it, they're all freaking out. Like, why is this happening? Does this mean there's something fundamentally wrong, um, something fun some fundamental problem that is going to cause Wikipedia to die out or crash or something like that over time? So there's been a lot of theories and a lot of, um, a lot of attempts to how, how do we address this problem. One of the possibilities, um, as we heard mentioned before, is that there's a lot of still bad people in the community that are driving away new people. And for those of you who maybe have run into those problems in OSM, that may hit a little bit close to home. Um, we need to make sure that we are being as inclusive as possible and making sure that people are, that new users are not getting driven away by their first encounter by some prickly personality um, who's been around in Wikipedia or in OSM for a long time. But one of the other things that might be a cause is Wikipedia has a, a rule or a guideline called the notability rule. And Wikipedia basically says an article has to be about a notable topic to be included. Um, as, as we say in OSM, we can map every tree, but in Wikipedia, a tree has to have some citations. It has to be an important tree. It has to be a significant tree by some type of metric. And this is one reason why the rate of articles is going down, and perhaps why people who are new to Wikipedia and try to create their first article and immediately get it deleted because it's not considered notable, maybe they never come back. Um, so, and this has been a debate that, that happened fairly early in the years of Wikipedia, and, and it got to the point where there were these two factions um, called inclusionists and deletionists. And some of these articles are a little bit sarcastic, the fact that these factions created Wikipedia pages for themselves. Um, <laughs> but basically, everyone kind of agrees that the deletionists won, that you can't arbitrarily just keep adding new pages about anything you want in Wikipedia. Um, the deletionist won, and that, that notability guideline is pretty strongly enforced. And I'm saying that, you know, they're still adding new articles. There's still new things to add articles about. But it's not growing quite as fast. And that might be one of the reasons why OSM um, is different. We do not have a notability rule. Um, basically, an arbitrary amount of detail is possible and to some extent condoned. You can add any tree you want, as many trees as you want. Um, but the problem is somebody's going to have to maintain it. What's that going to look like? Um, that was one of the main arguments of the deletionists in Wikipedia is if you let people add an article about anything, you have so many articles and functionally you can't have people maintaining them um, uh, to the degree you need them to be maintained. And so in my research, I'm trying to think about this idea of maintenance in OSM. What does that look like? What do we call it? How do we detect it looking at the, the fingerprint of maintenance in the OSM data? I'm borrowing a concept from the Wikipedia research in the Wikipedia community called Wikigardeners. So a Wikigardener is someone who, you know, you, they sometimes use the word like a wiki gnome. There's somebody who just like fixes grammar, fixes broken links. Somebody who really gets off on maintaining the, da the data, these articles. Um, and luckily there's enough people in the world who do that, who enjoy that that Wikipedia maintains really high quality articles that are usually pretty, pretty clean. Usually there's not that many broken links. Um, you need to have enough people who enjoy that type of, those unglamorous, those kind of behind the scenes tasks to maintain something like that. So what might that look like in OSM? Um, I'm trying to come up with this idea called map gardening. What would that look like? What is map gardening in OSM? What are those editing tasks that people might do to keep OSM going? The things that happen after that fun trailblazing phase of mapping all the streets in your neighborhood. Most of us have not had a chance to do that because when we joined OSM, our neighborhood was already on the map. And most of the new people who joined OSM going forward are gonna be in that same spot. So how do we make sure that OSM is a healthy community that has gardening, has um, people who enjoy maintenance, and that those tasks are valued? 
Okay, so let me st step back a bit, way back to the origin of the universe. Um, and, and I'm going to try to pull some cosmological metaphors um, out of the growth of the universe and try to come up with similar ideas and apply them to OSM and see what that would look like. I'm just going to let you look at this for a second while I take a drink, because we're looking at the beginning of the universe. So when I grew up thinking about science and astronomy, um, we knew the universe was expanding from the Big Bang. Nobody quite knew if it was going to have enough gravity to kind of retract and become a big, the big crunch, or if it was just going to expand forever. In the more recent years, they've actually discovered that the universe is expanding even faster. Something is making it accelerate. So now, instead of like just the big crunch we have to worry about, we might have something called the big rip. So if this dark energy out there is forcing things apart faster and faster, the universe might just kind of tear apart and everything, every molecule and particle will be you know, millions of light years away from each other. So it all depends on the kind of fundamental constants of the universe, how the particles relate to each other. We don't really know how it's going to play out, but we can imagine various scenarios. So in OSM, um, these are four possible scenarios, and maybe there's more, um, that, that seem to me like they, they might be analogs of those. And I'll talk about each of these four um, for the rest of the talk. But basically, the ratio of adding new features and editing those features, ratios of growth of the community uh, versus stagnation, these are all different factors that will go into the cosmological future of OSM. And how might we look at a chart that would show these kind of things? So this is with made-up data, and I'll show you real data in a moment. Um, and, but time is not on either of these axes. Um, what we have here is the number of nodes that we create along the bottom going to the right. Um, and then we have the number of edits, modified nodes. So um, I'm basically looking at the OSM history file. I'm looking at every feature and every node, actually. I'm ignoring ways. Um, I'm ignoring relations just to make it simpler. Um, and I'm seeing what version number each node is at, when did it um, get created, and when did it get modified. So every time there's a created node in the database, I'm adding to this number along the bottom. So it's cumulative. Um, if the number of nodes started going down, people started deleting that, I wouldn't capture that here, because I'm just looking at every time somebody adds something, it moves to the right. Every time somebody modifies a node, our chart moves to the top. And so then these dots show where the total is at each year, the end of each year. So hypothetically, we should see a certain number of new nodes happening and a certain number of edited nodes happening. And this chart will kind of wiggle up to the right as people add nodes and modify them. But this is not real data. I'll show you real data. Um, and so these are also, what are some of those scenarios, again, with fake data, what that might look like. The first scenario um, I'm calling the ghost town is if the dots start slowing down, people add less and less things each year, and they modify less and less things each year. So this would happen if maybe our community becomes more and more toxic to new people. People start leaving. Um, maybe our data model and our tools become, become too complex. Maybe everyone just gets bored. Um, but eventually, people just leave the community, and we're left with a ghost town. Um, it wouldn't, of course, look like this. This is just the first um, search result for ghost town in OSM. Um, but it, it would look like the complete map that we have today, but imagine that everybody walked away and we just, you know, 10 years down the road, you'd have a, a map that looks complete, except no one would have updated it in 10 years. It would be getting progressively obsolete. I don't think this is, I don't think it's going to happen, but it could. And this is one of the possible scenarios we might be facing. Scenario number two is if we slowly decrease the number of new things we're adding, but we keep editing them, we keep modifying them. This would be if we instituted in OSM a notability rule, maybe. We're saying, all right, we want roads, we want buildings, maybe we want addresses, but we're going to say trees, that's too much. Mailboxes, that's too much. And eventually, we'll have added 
all the roads. We'll have added all the buildings. Um, we'll have added all the, all the addresses. And we just have to maintain what we've got. Um, this could be a cool scenario, too. Um, and it could look like a garden. Um, I'm talking metaphorically about gardens. I just happen to be taking a lot of screenshots of gardens in OSM. Some of them are pretty awesome. Um, here's one of a nice, really well-mapped riverbank. This riverbank is going to move every year. Um, so even if we decided not to add anything new to OSM, we would need a community of people who are really into maintaining it, changing all the riverbanks, um, if this garden added a new parking lot for the visitor's area, we'd have to add that, those kind of things, but not adding any new types of features. And if you have any other good gardens in OSM, um, please send them to me, I'm collecting them. So what if the reverse happens, though? What if we just keep adding new things, adding more and more detail, but we're not keeping up with the maintenance? Um, we start to add every tree. And when we get bored of adding all the trees, we start adding all the blades of grass. Um, Harry Wood had a great talk about, about a gardening metaphor at um, State of the Map in 2011. Um, his slides are online. It's pretty cool. And he talked about, yeah, like the, one of the most insane things you could imagine would be adding every blade of grass in OSM. But I'm sure you could imagine something more insane than that. And so why am I calling this the, um, the Borgesian map? Well. Some of you who are into cartography or geography have probably heard this a gazillion times, but if you haven't, it's so great the first people, first time you, you hear about these kind of stories. But um, Jorge Luis Borges had this short story, and the short story is actually one paragraph long. This is basically it. Um, that is a made-up quote from some historical book that he imagined existed um, about this ancient empire where the geographers and cartographers were so obsessed with making the most detailed map, they made a map that had basically everything in the world on the map. It was a one-to-one -one scale map. And of course, that's completely useless because it has to be as big as the world. Um, and so in the story, basically, they succeeded, and then it was useless, and then the map itself just kind of falls apart and is a wasteland. Um, and you see, you can still find parts of that one-to-one -one map out in the desert somewhere. So what would that look like in OSM? Um, we're still not nearly ne at the point of adding useful detail, I think. Um, here is a, a demo that um, Lu Huang made from civic data. This is not from OSM. But it's an example of what if we mapped the edges of every road? That could be really cool. It would be really useful for self-driving cars, things like that. Um, maybe we'll do that. Maybe we're, we're going to have enough time um, on our hands to do that over, over the future of OSM. Um, we already do have area features for pedestrian ways, like in, in a city center where you have um, a, a road area that is large enough to be represented as a polygon. We could extend that to basically everything. But you could even go further. Um, again, this is not an OSM. This is an example of some city data from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and they have a GIS file of every painting mark on the road. We could do this in OSM, and it might be really fun. Um, but it's totally going to get obsolete. Um, if they repaint that road, hopefully somebody's watching OSM and knows to like change the paint marks in the OSM database. It'll be really hard to keep this up to date. OK, so finally, what if we keep adding new stuff, but what if we somehow find a way to maintain it? Um, I'm mixing the metaphors, the terminology a little bit here. I'm not talking about a cosmological singularity like a black hole. Um, this is more like a Ray Kurzweil, like what if computation and information overload just keeps expanding to the point where we can't mentally keep up with it anymore. We don't even know what that would look like. It's past the point of prediction. Um, that's the singularity. Maybe that's possible in OSM. Maybe we can have every blade of grass mapped and we can keep it up to date. Probably not, but that's another kind of possible endpoint of these scenarios. So what do we actually have in the OSM data? Um, this is the real planet file. And um, after the first few slow years, there's almost no difference between 2006 and 2007. Um, we start to see some activity. And then basically from 2010 on, we're kind of maintaining the same ratio of, of edits and maintenance edits. This spike here where there's a bunch of early maintenance is apparently from 
a early version of the Potlatch editor, which was doing live edits to the OSM database, where if you're, if you're modifying a feature, you might have just moved it a little bit on the map and you've created version 10 of that feature because every movement um, created a modification. So here's London. It looks like the dots are slowing down a little bit. Is London getting finished? I'm not sure. Here's Berlin, those last three dots of like 2014, 2015, 2016, they look like they're speeding up in Berlin. Um, but these are both like examples of really well mapped cities in OSM. Here's an example of Tokyo. So, I mean, as a geographer, looking at one chart of the whole world uh, of the entire planet file doesn't tell us that much. So I'm really interested in seeing what do the different um, parts of, of different cities, different parts of the world look like. And they look very different. So Tokyo is a lot flatter here. They're adding more stuff. They're not doing as many maintenance edits. Maybe this is a bit more of a Borgesian map. And we can look at places where there have been um, hot activations, places like Haiti, where some years there's almost no activity, and then there's a jump in one year, and then there's no activity, and there's a jump in one year. This is like a, a, the fingerprint of a, of a community that has bursts of activity but might be um, sputtering at other times. So we can see San Francisco where you have like a big flat jump where you had a tiger import. And then you see that the actual amount of activity is um, quite significant. It totally swamps that early tiger activity. And then we see something like, like Moscow. Um, I was really surprised by this one because it's, it's very steady. It's like there is a very clear pattern to activity in, in Moscow and it's different from everywhere else. They do a lot more maintenance edits than the um, as a proportion of the new features they're adding. Why are they different? Um, is there something cultural about the OSM community in Russia? I don't know yet. And finally, I don't even know if this is at all tenable, but I was like, okay, well, what are we looking for? What is a actual value of maintenance that we want to see? I mean, we need to do maintenance when people add new features that have errors. So every time there is a new feature in OSM, and there's got to be some natural human error error rate. We have to maintain those. Also, everything that's in OSM that reflects something in the real world, when the things in the real world change, we have to maintain those. So there's an error rate of adding new things. There's the change rate of things in the real world. Those two factors should combine into a number of gardening edits. Um, what would that look like? Can we figure out a way to say, this OSM community is healthy. They've got enough maintenance. This one is not. Um, still kind of at the beginning of asking those kind of questions. Um, and I would invite you to please follow along with the slides at sta.mn slash hdp. Um, uh, hit me up on Twitter. Let's have this conversation. What can we tell from these questions and what does it tell us about OSM? Thank you. And I, and I used up most of my time. I have like one or two questions, maybe. And he's coming around with a microphone. Okay, yeah, yeah. Start shouting, please. Do you plan to look at things that either are a regional or a country or even a continental scale uh, versus just the, the city scales? Um, yeah, could, could I and, and, and would I look at it at, at different scales from just cities? Um, I'd love to. Um, and right now, I'm just trying to finish my dissertation without changing my underlying <laughs> research technique. But, but basically, the, the new stuff that's coming out in the last year or two of like, you know, the Mapbox, uh, the vector tiles for, for analysis, um, stuff that that um, has really been happening in the last few years since I started this. Um, it would be great. I would love to have people take these approaches and apply it to more flexible geographies. That would be amazing. Thank you. Um, sorry for my English. Um, I'm from Colombia. Uh, how do you think uh, affect the, this curve, the contribution from, from mobile application? Like, like, for example, here, there is a discussion about the map me contribution, contribution from the fonts at the map. So yeah, the question about how mobile contributions make a difference. Um, I think the way we edit will, ma will make a big difference in terms of how much we can keep up with OSM. Um, I think the way we as humans are working with bots that are operating in OSM, the way we're using things like 
the sign detection from Mapillary, um, how much we can kind of augment our editing activity will probably go a long way to do these maintenance tasks. Um, how can we create visualizations that will um, tell us where a problem is so we can go and find it um, or prompt us while we're on a mobile phone to like, this doesn't look right based on this left turn you just made. You know? So I think that stuff is happening right now and it's, and it's going to become more important. Um, and so when we think about things like the singularity of human intelligence and computer intelligence, that's going to be an important question going forward in OSM. Like, what does it mean to be a human editor versus uh, an augmented editor or a bot? Um, what does it mean to look at signals from someone else's uh, mobile phone tracking data? Like, are they contributing to OSM or is only me the one who's looking at their data and adding to the database? Um, I think those are very important questions. See you back there. Um, I just had a question. You know, a lot of the things you talked about were really big urban density areas, and I'm wondering about the opposite, like national parks or city parks, things that have special nodes, trails, parking lots, to see if maybe the data dump is more accurate and doesn't require as much editing, as opposed to maybe street names that change or address that change or businesses. If you could comment, if you've thought about that or researched anything. You mean things that are that are that are popular, like a city park where a lot of people are going there. Yeah, but may not have um, a density of people who live there. And I think of mm -hmm. in the U.S., you know, the big national parks, uh, Rocky Mountain National Park, Olympic, Rainier, that will be um, important landmarks that will, should be tagged. Important trails, uh, restrooms, you know, parking lots, visitor centers um, that are pretty standard and stationary, and may not change names often or change locations or hours or things like that, depending on the specific node that I could see more in uh, urban areas that may change more frequently. Yeah, yeah, um, that's uh, definitely the, the differential quality of OSM across different places um, for demographic reasons, for just the places that are more visited um, is hugely important and something that I'm not really able to control for here. But um, yeah, to, if, I, if I could generalize this technique to look at specific types of nodes like are park benches maintained more frequently than waste baskets in a park? You know, like what what types of things are more prone to being obsolete or need need focus? Um, what things can we trust more from OSM because we we know they'll be maintained more often? Um, that would be really important too to like see and to see like what these waves of maintenance are like. Um, like when you add a certain type of feature, do we expect that then that always will? Will park benches will come after that? You know, the, the 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 cause and effect will be really interesting to see if we can if we can tease out some of these numbers based on the type of edit and the location. Yeah. All right. Thank you.